So what we want to do this afternoon is put this all together in what it would look like in everyday life. Okay, one of the one of the things that I think we need to work on over and over and over again is making sure that we don't lead in such a way that what we're teaching and training can only be done in a particular place and time and can't be transferred and reproduced. So like a lot of times when I talk about the difference between leading a church and leading a movement, and I, I shouldn't even distinguish it that way, I'd say like leading a church that it doesn't want to be about multiplication. Um, you can actually build your church in such a way that it can't reproduce. So if you build it in such a way that it's primarily built around a particular kind of leader, and I'm not talking about like a, a particular calling, like an evangelist. I'm talking about like a unique personality type. Like, you know, like if, if this church was built right, primarily to support who I am as a leader, and it was built around my unique abilities and strengths, then what would happen is it would never get reproduced. Because you couldn't go do it unless you had me. And so if you want things to be able to be um, go beyond one to multi-generational, you have to do it in such a way that you're training your people in principles and concepts that are transferable, meaning they can go into any culture and context, so they're not culturally specific, um, that they are re reproducible, which means not only can they go into any con uh, culture, but they can be done by any kind of person. Um, in terms of unique personality types and such. They might, you know, I, I think they're unique callings. I don't think you're going to go plant a church primarily if you have just a shepherd. You're going to probably need some evangelists and I, I would say apostolic leadership at some point. So I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about are the principles such that you could go and do them in another place and could, could lots of people go do them or is there only one who can do them? And then lastly, they're sustainable. Meaning, you're calling people to something that actually could continue on in everyday life. It's not something where it's like it takes tons of energy, tons of money, tons of resources, and can, you could only do it for a little bit because if you did it for too long, it would kill you. And I think there's a lot of a lot of the work we do. It's like it's literally just too much. You're calling people to a life that you can't live, and so it's not sustainable. You know, it might. It might be a week-long commitment or a once hour, one hour a week commitment, but a lifetime commitment of mission, it probably couldn't be. So I'll give you an example of that. When I was at Willow Creek, um, you know, we wanted our people to, we had five Gs. So there was like grace was, you're coming to the, to the evangelism weekend uh, gathering, growth, you go to the week, midweek teaching service, um, gifts, you're all using your gifts in some place of service in the church uh, outside of those other two, uh, like maybe traveling with children's ministry or whatever it may be. Um, groups, so now you had to be in a small group. And then giving, you had to, of course, give your money and time to, to the, the work. And so, and then on top of that, we want you to do evangelism and be in your community and involved with your neighbors. And you're like, okay, you can't do all that. Nobody can do all that. That's, there's no way. So most of my kids were spending, like I was a student pastor, student ministries pastor, most of my kids just lived at the building all week long. Uh, and so they had almost zero friendships with unbelievers, even though it was Willow Creek, known for evangelism. But we had, we had organized and structured the church in such a way that they were too busy to do the work that we were, we were actually training them to do. So it was unsustainable. And so you don't want to create an unsustainable kind of work. So as we wrestled through... How do, we, how do we build and lead SOMA so that if anybody were a part of our church for a few years, they could go to any part of the world and do it again? That was one question. Two, they wouldn't need us to go do it for them. That's the reproducibility. And three, they could do it in that normal everyday life. That's the sustainability. So, and if you know much about missions, that's what missionaries have to figure out how to do. They have to have, figure out how to go to another part of the world and get into the rhythms and life of that culture and actually join the people in their life and then reach them in the middle of everyday life. So that led us to the question of, you know, how do we do transferable, reproducible, sustainable? And how does it get worked out in everyday life? Now, hopefully what you've heard so far is everything I gave you up until here should be, in your mind, transferable, reproducible, sustainable. 
You know, like who God is, we should be able to teach that to any culture. What he's done for us and is doing and will do, any culture. Who we are, it's the same for every person who's a part of the body of Christ. We're all family of God. We're all servants of Jesus. We're all missionaries sent on his mission. That's not culturally, you know, contained or culturally restrictive. And how we live, we love one another like family. We serve the least of these like Jesus served us. And we're sent as missionaries who witness to Jesus Christ in, in word and deed. That's all transferable. I didn't give you, so you gather on Sunday, get a big building, get good worship, get good tea. I didn't give you any of that. Because as soon as I start to get to that, I'm now putting a cultural restriction on what it means to be God's people. That, that may happen, but it should be the outcome of you figuring out what it means to be God's people who live in light of who we are in the place we live in. And that may look different. If you're in the South, you may do a lot more of gathering than you might if you were in another part of the world where you get killed if you gather. You know, like, it's a, it's a real luxury for, for us to talk about gathering in big buildings because we live in, in a Western context where you don't get killed publicly for gathering. And you have these massive facilities that you can spend tons of money on and Christians seem to be okay buying them. So, like, that's our culture. That's not most of the world. So if you give people that and tell them to go do that in their context, you pretty much have given them a recipe for how to be ineffective as a church in most contexts in the world. So if we want to be a to the ends of the earth kind of movement, we've got to teach our people how to be a church, a people on mission that could work everywhere. Okay? So I, I, sometimes I'll actually meet with church planners, and I was meeting with one, this is probably about a year ago, we were talking about um, what we're doing, and he was actually considering coming into the family of Soma, and we were talking about how if we're, he's going to do that, he's gonna, we're going to ask him to teach a Trinitarian identity. And he said, yeah, but we have like a lot of other statements we use for what people are. And I said, well, what are they? And they were really cool and creative and hip, and I'm like, well, those are awesome. Like, I think those are really good for you and your context and your place, but if you want to be part of a movement, you got to stop being so cool, and you got to start get, getting to the irreducibles that anybody can then contextualize wherever they go. And if you're not willing to do that, then just be a church, but you won't be a church planning movement. Yeah. Um, so if you want to be a church planning movement, you got to be willing to not be cool and get down to the basics of what can be transferred. And then if people want to put cool on it in their context, let them do it. But you want, if you want to multiply, you have to get back to the basics. So he didn't really want to do that, so that's fine. I said, that's probably you probably won't fit our DNA because we want to just make it as simple and reproducible as possible for people to take elsewhere. Um, so just think through that in your own context, too. It's not wrong to use language that fits your culture. You will need to do that. Like we have some people who, instead of using the word missionary, because they live in a very highly Mormon, Mormon population, a lot of Mormons are living there, that doesn't make sense to them because the missionary are the people who take a couple years off and, you know, the kids who do two years of mission. So they're using ambassador instead. You know, or I think some of you use witness. You know, and so they're, they're using the same idea with a word that makes sense in their culture. But as soon as you go like, yeah, we're going to give you 10 cool identity statements, like guaranteed people aren't going to transfer that. So just encourage you to keep thinking simple, reproducible, transferable, something a normal person could explain, you know, because they're going to have to be able to teach others the same. But if it all is dependent on you doing it all, then they won't be able to transfer it. Okay. So, so with that said, we realize that on this side of the what we do equation, there is the basics of how we live, like love one another, serve, witness to Jesus. But we wanted to work that out in what that looks like in the everyday stuff of life. What are the rhythms of life? And we, when we look at the elder requirements, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but... What you see is people who are setting an example for the body. So they're just living a life that the whole church is supposed to live. They just happen to be the examples and the ones who can teach how to do it. And so they, they exa they're examples and they're trainers of the body. And then they give oversight to make sure we're being faithful to stay true to what we believe and what we're called to live out in light of what we believe. But when you look at an elder, they're really just doing stuff that everybody should be doing. And it's pretty much normal stuff. Like, okay, don't get drunk. You know, don't be addicted to substances. You know, be, be gentle. Be respectable. Have a good reputation with outsiders. That means you actually have unbelievers that would invite you to their party. 
you know, and think well of you. Um, be hospitable, open your home to the stranger, the people who don't belong. Um, be self-controlled, um, you know, don't be violent. I mean, you read it and you're going like, this just sounds like a good Christian, you know? Not drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. I mean, and then you get a few things that may be a little bit unique, like, okay, they have to be able to teach. Not everybody's able to teach, but hopefully if you're training up disciples, they're able to teach others to do the same. So hopefully you're expecting every disciple to eventually be able to teach. But some are able to do it as an example in how they teach. You know? They're able to manage their own household well. What does that mean? Well, that means they actually were a leading an oikos, a, a, follow, a group of followers in the faith. Some were their immediate family, some were their extended family, some were just brought into the family to care for like family. And they led that household of faith pretty well like a little church. That's pretty much what they were doing. Uh, we tend to think that means they have to be a good husband, a good father, you know, mainly they have do a good job with their own children. In their context, it was much more than just their wife and children. It was an extended family, an oikos. And you could do some study on oikos if you want later. But it really is the equivalent of a house church. Uh, so they could lead, they could at least lead that size of a church before they're leading a, a, a city church of churches or overseeing the church in a city or a place. Okay? So there had to be some leadership ability and some things like that. But keep in mind, the majority of the requirements are just hey, the elders are going to set an example for you so you'll know how to live. The way that we often say it is, elders are over, amongst, and under. Paul says that we're overseers. We will give an account. Uh, we, we, we're shepherding the flock under our care. So that's that's the overseer. That's making sure we're true to what we say. We protect the flock from, sheep, or from wolves and hired hands. Side note, don't ever have anybody uh, leading in your church in a paid staff position that wouldn't do it unless they were, only, unless they were paid. Okay, like I think that's one of the, we have become a, like an a employment agency in the church. And it's like if they wouldn't come serve that church and love those people if they weren't paid, then you should rethink whether or not they should be a part of your staff. Okay, so some of you guys are going, that's too high of an expectation. I don't think so at all. That's the hired hand. I'm only here because I get a paycheck. If you're only in the church you're in because you get a paycheck, watch out. Okay? Second, there, we don't let the wolves in. Those are the people who use the body and devour it for their own good. Okay? So we've got to watch that. So an overseer is protecting the church from those kinds of things. They're amongst, First Peter says, they're to be uh, elders who shepherd the flock and they're amongst them and they set an example to the flock. So this is whatever you think is normative for the rest of the church. They're the lead example of what that looks like. So you're going, we want everyone in the church to be in a missional community or a small group. The elders are also in one. Now, if I've, I've been to churches and they're like, yeah, our elders are in a small group with elders. Okay, so do you, are you letting all the rest of your church be in a small group with the people that they do work with and the people that they prefer to do work with, the people that get along with them and agree with them on everything? Because if that's what your elders get to do, then the church gets to do that too. No, no, we don't. Okay, well, then you might want to rethink and maybe actually ask, ask your elders to be in groups where they don't necessarily, aren't with all their peers, you know? So they might still want to hang out with the elders, but that's why they're worthy of double honor. Because not only do they do the work of an overseer, they set the example to do what everybody else should do. So that's the double, there's a double honor because there's a different kind of requirement for elders. So they're an example. And then under, Jesus says, the way it works with us is that the least are the greatest. Uh, he wants to, be great, we'll need to be a servant. And so that's how he defines leadership in the church is that we're servant leaders, not, over, not people who are overbearing or domineering or looking for position or title or a top-down kind of thing. And, and uh, so you guys have probably heard us regularly say that we don't, we don't have a senior pastor here other than Jesus Christ, and he's the only one at the top of the org chart in our church. And we just believe that's biblical. He's the head of the church. Um, so we, we are then under shepherds under Jesus as we serve our king and we're under our people in the sense that we're serving them just like Christ lowered himself down as a servant. So we want to be over in that we protect and oversee amongst and that we give an example and under in that we're serving with the gifts and talents God's given us to best take care for the body with our gifts. So that's kind of how we do it. Now why did I put that all out there? Because this particular piece, the amongst, the example, is going to be, have to be done in normal, everyday stuff of life. Because if the only example they see is you on a stage, 
or you, you, know, you when you're leading a family meeting, then you're actually giving them an example they can't follow because they're not going to get to do that. If the only example is preaching the word in a place where everybody sits and have to be quiet for an hour and they have a you know, captivated audience because no one gets to interrupt you and you got to prepare all week long, well, they're not, that's not an example because they don't have anybody. They're not going to work and everyone's going like, hey, just teach and we won't interrupt. You know, and tell us about Jesus and we'll just agree and, and prepare for a couple hours in the workplace for the message you're going to give us this afternoon at lunchtime. Like, that's not an example. They can't, you got to show them in normal stuff of life what it looks like to follow Jesus so they can be people who follow Jesus in normal life. So as we wrestled through that, we realized we can't, we've got to be careful to not make their, their dominant understanding of church an event, but rather the dominant understanding of church is God's people on God's mission in the world in the everyday stuff of life. We still gather together. The event's good. It's good to gather. It's good to exhort. It's good to remind them. Obviously, we're having a set-aside gathering for your development. That's good. It's not bad. But I'm not setting an example for you at all right now other than how to train a class. So you want to learn... But you want to watch me and follow my example, you're going to have to come to my house and you're going to have to hang out with my missional community. You're going to have to watch me with my neighbors and you're going to have to see me in the stuff of life, eating meals and celebrating and all that. So that's where we realize we've got to help people see that there are everyday normal rhythms of life. And as we wrestled with this, we said we've got to teach them in everyday life. Why don't we go back to pre-fall and identify what it was that was in the rhythm of life for Adam and Eve before the serpent tempted them? And they gave in. And which of those rhythms of life do we see all the way through the, the story of God's people in Israel and God telling them to make sure they do those rhythms unto him now? And what would be those rhythms of life, if we got the right ones, what would be the ones that we would see in any culture, in any context, in any part of the world? Because they should be consistent if they are the fundamental, irreducible rhythms of life. And if we get those... And then we teach people how to live those with gospel intentionality as a family of missionary servants. Then we'll have actually trained them on how to be God's people in all of life in a way that can go to any part of the world. Does that make sense? That's kind of what we're going to do now. So what I'd like you to do, um, I want you to just with me, some of you already know these, but without thinking about what we've said they are, what do you think are the basic rhythms of life found in the garden before the fall found throughout Israel's history, found in any culture and context anywhere in the world that everybody will engage in on a regular, yeah, regular way of life. So there's work. We eat. Rest. Okay. I'm going to put rest and work as recreation. Because actually in the, and I'll put that together later, you'll see. Um, in the beginning, Genesis 1 and 2, when God creates, he said he rested from his work. So you, now you see the equivalent of work and creation as the same thing. God defines work as our creative our abilities put into effort towards something. So, and then rest is what we do when we're not doing that. So there's the re recreate is how we put those two together, work and rest. So, okay, Anything else? Play. Yeah, there's play. There's playfulness. There's fun. Celebration. Celebrate. Okay, those would probably be, I would say, like, almost everywhere you go, like, even if you go to a place where they don't have toys, they make things to become toys. You know, like, you know, they'll get a, a hoop, and they'll just be rolling that thing down. You know, we're spoiled. Like, we have people tell us how to play. In m many parts of the country or world, they figure out how to play. Like, they, they exert their playfulness in creative fun. And we're like, I don't know what to do. You know, like my kids all the time are like, what are we going to do? I'm like, do you know how many kids just play around the world without anybody telling them? Like, I'm going to go buy you a toy or whatever. I mean, you know, right? I could, we got our Sierra Leone brother here. He, he could tell you about how to play with probably lots of, not as much stuff as we have, right? <laughs> so we're spoiled here. And I don't know if it's good for us. I think it's, it killed some of our creativity. But so there's a playfulness. There's a celebration. All these happen on a normal every week or every day basis. And there's this, it's just the stuff of life. And so we've, we've added a couple more in here that you guys didn't say. It's th usually some people say relate because you just relate to people on a regular basis. You know, there's a relation. Adam and Eve were one flesh. 
There was a relatability amongst humanity. Uh, we've changed that to call it listen, because relating is actually knowing and being known. In order to do that, you actually have to be receptive to others, allowing them to make themselves known to you, which means you're going to have to take the posture of listening. We're going to walk through each one of these. And then there's another one that we put in here called story. Now, I'm going to simplify it in just a sec. And, and you might go, that's not a rhythm. Call it storying if you want. Call it, we call it story formed. But the idea is everybody is living in the rhythm of their cultural story. It's always going on. It's, their, it's what informs how they see the world. And if they're a follower of Jesus, they have a new story, and that's the, the, the gospel narrative. And they're all living in that. And then all of us have our own personal story that's informing how we do everything we do. So we basically tried to simplify this down a little bit. We wanted to try and make it six if possible, because people don't, re and I'm not sure that everybody remembers all these, to be honest. Did I, I spawn that right? I think so. So we would say story formed, or you could say storying, listen, bless, celebrate, eat, and recreate. And this is our way of putting rest and work together, okay? Because that's a rhythm of your week, actually, okay? So those are the ones that we kind of landed on. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to, I'm going to teach through each one of these with the intent of helping you work through what does it take to be a good missiologist and um, really help your people learn how to be out there on mission in everyday life, capturing the everyday life as unto the Lord. But before I do that, I want to just give you a little bit of what's been helpful for us as a way of explaining it. How many of you guys have an iPad or know of what an iPad is? Okay, I think most of you. So... Um, so, you know, when you have an iPad, well, I guess I don't need to draw it. I've got one right over here. So you've got an iPad, you know, because I'm not a very good drawer, and this looks better than what I just did. So, so an iPad, there's a, there's a hardware. There's a, uh, this, this is the hardware, okay, the, the machinery itself. And um, if you know much about Steve Jobs, he wanted to control the user's experience from front to end. He wanted to have a high quality all the way through. And, um, and so then they also have an uh, operating system in it. Right now it's OS 7, if, at least in mine. You may not have upgraded yours yet, but it's OS 7. Um, and then, then everybody, if they want to, has the freedom to create individual apps, applications, on here. So those are all the apps. Okay, and you can expand them, and those are apps there. And every single app is designed to work with this operating system on this hardware. But the beauty is the creativity is unlimited once you put together a framework, okay? So you guys are going, where is he going with this? Uh, why yeah, this? We, we look at, if you're a PC, you really don't get it. I know that, like, sorry. But um, <clears throat> we, we look at a missional community, which we'll talk a lot more about on Monday, as the hardware. This family of missionary servants sent as disciples who make disciples, that, that's the thing that we don't get to mess with. We believe God set it into our baptismal identity. This is who we are. Therefore, it informs what everything has to be about. Okay? We believe that the operating system is the gospel, the thing that makes the whole thing work. It's the power. It's the system that God has put hardwired into his new creation world that we would operate with Jesus at the center of it, his spirit empowering it. It's all gospel-empowered stuff. And we look at putting, applying these six rhythms in a particular context as the thing that's going to create unique missional communities, unique applications of how they apply all of these truths in a particular context. So if I were going to use the language I used earlier, if this is theology, and this is Christology, and this is ecclesiology, and this is missiology, I would say this is contextualizing your missiology. It's now saying, in a people and place, what is it going to look like to live in light of what we believe in this, in this place? And good missiologists, when they go to a culture, they figure out what these are, and then they do them with gospel intentionality in that place. And that's what we want to train our people. We want to train our people to begin to have the eyes to see what are the rhythms of the, the community we're being sent to that are normative, 
And how do we engage them with gospel intentionality so we become a peculiar people in their place so they know what it looks like to follow Jesus in that place? For instance, you get a group of artists and they love Jesus and they live in the arts community and they're writing music and performing and doing all that stuff. They should engage in all of the same rhythms of life that artists do in that culture, but they do them as unto the Lord and therefore they don't give themselves over to sin in the middle of that culture, but an artist who's with them could go, now I know what it means to be a disciple of Jesus as an artist in this culture because I've watched you do it in front of me in the normal stuff of life. If what we teach them is you've got to leave your life and you've got to come to a building and you're going to go to classes and you've got to do all kinds of stuff you wouldn't normally do in all of life and that's what it means to be a Christian, what we end up doing is robbing the mission field of the missionaries. Because as soon as they come to faith, they think they have to leave their context and go join the church. Instead of seeing the church is in the context, in the rhythms of life, in light of all the gospel they believe, so they look very different, but they're doing the same things. That's what we're after. Now, just so I'm clear, I'm not saying they're doing the same things in terms of sin. I'm just saying the, the same general activities. Okay? Now, I'm going to walk through what they are, and then I'm gonna, we're going to put a lot of flesh on it. Okay? Um, so first of all, story. You guys went to the story. We believe that every believer in Jesus should be able to tell the story of God from creation to um, rest, final restoration. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. They should be able to tell the overarching story of God because it, it, is, it is our story. Like if I were to ask you, tell me about your life story, you could tell it. But if I said, tell me about your, the gospel story in terms of what God has done to make you his child and you couldn't tell it, that would concern me quite a bit because your dominant story now is your personal story of growing up in your family instead of the story of God changing your life. And so they need to be able to tell the story of, no, I believe in a God who created, and we rebelled, and he created a people to be his display people on the earth. They failed as well, so we needed to have a, the ultimate display people, and that was Jesus. Jesus really is the true and better Israel. Jesus comes and does what Israel could not do. He lives a life as a blessing to the nations. And not only does he do that, but he gives up his life so that he might rescue us all in so that we could be the true Israel that gets to be the people of God on the planet through which Jesus lives and dwells and he's the king. And now through his people, the church, he's now telling the better story of what God has done and he's bringing more and more people into the family and ultimately at the end of day, he's going to come and make all things new and we're going to dwell with him in a new land, a new earth, and we're going to enjoy him forever worshiping Jesus as our king. Now that's a very short version of the story. If I had more time, I would take you through a lot longer version of the story, okay? But we need to be able to have people know that story because it's their story, okay? Now, here's the deal. If we take these things that we talked about, who we are, family, and we were to apply it to this story, what would we expect? You love one another like family, and we're story-formed people. And what this means is, we're living our life under a dominant story. As God's people, we have the dominant story. But the reality is we also have our individual stories that are still being redeemed. As a family of God, how would you be story formed together? What would you do? You'd tell your story. You'd expect that everybody in the missional community would know each other's stories or in your church that's working together. And obviously, if your church is hundreds of people, you can't know everybody's story. So you're going to have to really think about how you reorder your church so that a few of you know each other's stories enough to actually be able to help each other become more story formed by the, the bigger story. Um, Randy's not here. He was here earlier. But Randy's a guy I've gotten to pour my life into. And, and um, he, I just handed the baton, my, my leadership job over to him about a month and a half ago. So he's now leading the implementation of our vision and preaching for SOMA in Tacoma. I'm no longer doing that. I'm an elder, but... I'm unpaid and I'm mentoring and serving the church in a different role. But I handed that off to him. Four and a half years ago, he was a brand new Christian. He came out of a family with a father who was extremely abusive. Left his family when he was real young, been with many women. Uh, Randy understood a dad as somebody who hits you, you know, and then leaves. That's kind of like my summation of his experience of dad. So he needed to have a different story. I remember one time we were praying together. Uh, we prayed together three days a week in the morning for several months in a row. I was trying to teach a bunch of our guys how to pray. So I said, okay, bring your Bible, bring your journal, 
and we're going to spend time learning how to listen to God in prayer. We'll open the word, we'll read it, we'll listen to God, because I think prayer needs to be a lot more about us shutting up and listening and less about us talking the whole time. So I'm trying to teach them how to actually pray, pray and we'll get to that in just a sec. Um, I think we do need to talk to God, but I don't think we, we don't listen enough. And so I was teaching them how to listen, and, and then we'd pray out loud too. So we'd listen, then we'd pray back what we're hearing, and, and his prayers were always like this, Lord God, would you please, God, would you just? And there was no, Father, thank you for your love. I know that you love to answer the request of your children. So, so I'm boldly coming to you without any fear because I know you can't wait to hear from me. You just love when your son asks for stuff that he needs. There was none of that. It was a very distant, far-off God who he was afraid to approach, or at least it sounded like it. And so I stopped him after many, many times of this. And by the way, if you want to know what people believe, listen to their prayer life. They'll tell you what they think of what God's like by how they pray. I mean, even I hear a lot of younger people, I'll just say this to you guys, use the word just a lot. Would you just, God, would you just, would you just, would you just? And I'm like, why do we say that? Do we think he doesn't really want to give us great things? Are we, are we underplaying his ability? Are we underplaying his generosity? Are we underplaying? Just is a word to say, like, I, I, I'm, I, want, I, I don't know that I can really ask you. There's a, there's a sense of I'm not confident that I can go to you. Instead of going... God, you are the God of the universe and my Father. I'm so glad I get to ask you for help right now. And we don't have to qualify it. We don't have to. So he was qualifying. He, God was distant. You could tell he didn't really know the Father. And um, so I stopped and I said, bro, um, do you know that God is your Father in Jesus because of what he's done in Jesus and that you're dearly loved and you can call him Dad? You know, Paul says we can call him, the Spirit says we can call him Abba, Father, Daddy. You know, I, I, want, I want to encourage you to Talk to your dad. He's better than the one that's on earth, okay? So let's talk to the real, true, heavenly father. And so he started again, Lord God, would you just, would you just? He just kept going. I'm like, stop. And this kept happening. Finally, I go, hold on. And I kept reminding him of the truth of the gospel for who he was in Christ, that he was a child of God, dearly loved, uh, that, that he's been fully justified, and he does not need to justify himself anymore, and all this stuff. And, and he just couldn't do it. And uh, I said, here's what I hear is happening. You still worship your earthly father. Because the way you're praying is though you're praying to your earthly father. And until you get the better story that you have a perfect father in heaven that revealed to you through Jesus, who is just eager to answer your request, loves it when his kids come to him and think he's rich and generous, and eager to give you a, a, a fish when you ask for it instead of a snake, and eager to give you bread instead of a rock, and loves to give good gifts to his kids. Until you believe that, you're going to continue to talk to him as though he's your earthly dad who beat you and left you. And I want to encourage you to repent and turn to the true Father in Jesus Christ and begin to worship him as the one who loves you dearly as a son. And uh, he wasn't quite there yet, and I said, I had to go to go off to a meeting. And so I want to encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the heart of the Father for you. And so he went to his bedroom. He told me later, got on, he said he was a little upset with me. You know, you can ask him later with all that. But he knew it was true. And uh, he got on his knees and asked the, the Spirit to reveal the heart, heart of the Father for him. And he said he just began to weep. And it's just like the Spirit washed over him, God's love and affection, and it just delivered him from all of the brokenness of his understanding of Father so that now he had a dear uh, affection for the Father in heaven. And I'll just tell you, the moment when that happened, it changed his entire ministry. Up until then, he was really hard. I mean, he still can be a little hard once in a while because like, he's still growing through it. But he was super hard, really strong-headed, super good at theology, super bad at loving. And, um, and I think a lot of us, that's where it's at. Our story is we have a theology about God, but not a relationship with God, not an intimate father-son, father-daughter kind of love. Um, and, and so how did, I, how did we get there? I knew his story. And I was listening for where the new story became his story instead of the old story. Okay? And if we, don't, if we want to help people go through gospel transformation, we're going to have to listen to their story and find out where their personal life story on this earth is still the dominant story instead of the new story that's theirs in Christ Jesus. And that can be in lots of things. You know, it can be they're still looking to their boss to be their 
their uh, affirmation. They're still, because that's what they wanted from their dad. They're looking for their work to justify them because when they worked really well in their par- with their parents, their parents said, I love you a lot. But when they didn't do good work at home, they said, I don't love you. So all they ever heard growing up was get good grades and I'll accept you. Get bad grades, I'll reject you. And so now they're working for God to get acceptance. Or, I mean, there could be all kinds of stories like this. And you, until you listen to their story, you won't know where they need the story, the better story to become their story. Okay? Now let me just take that into missionary, family of missionary servants. If you're a missionary, how do you work that out? You're sent to a people group. That's right, you're going to need to know the the cultural narrative, the cultural story of that city or that country or that community. You know, if you're going to reach a bunch of artists, you need to understand a lot of those artists are using art as a way to kind of express themselves. There's a, and it, depending on which kind of place you're in, they're, they're dealing with different, a lot of times artists are prophetic and they're actually speaking against the cultural story. But if you don't know them well enough, you don't know where their brokenness is speaking against the cultural story. So you want to help redeem that so they can speak uh, a redemptive cultural critique instead of just a sinful cultural critique. So you'll know the culture, you know, the city's story, the culture's story. Yep. Anything else? You want to know people's story too. If you're reaching out to people who don't know Jesus, you've got to take time to get to know who they are. Uh, this is, I think this is one of the reasons why our evangelism isn't very effective because we don't take the time to listen to people. And so unlike Paul, we don't have a clue what the good news should sound like in the context we're in because we don't know what bad news is in that context. So we're preaching good news to, to the problem we don't know. We don't really know where it is that they need Jesus to rescue them from their unbelief and their sin and rebellion. But if you get to know them, you know how the gospel is good news to them. Okay? Right? You guys doing okay? I know that after lunch it's like a hard time to stay with me. So, um, so as a missionary, you get to know the story of the culture and the story of the people that God's sending you to. Both uh, the meta-narrative of the culture as well as the micro-narrative of the person. Make sense? Then as servants, and I'm not going to go through every one of these like this, but I just want to give you a, a way that you can help your people think. Now as servants, you're actually going to change your language. You're going to change, you're going to translate. You're going to be mindful of. You know, if you, you go like certain cultures, and you, you know, like I know in the Northwest, there's been so much abuse of, of male, like the kind of bravado masculinity that people in the Northwest have super, they've really rejected it. Now they've gone too far and they become like anti-men, you know? And so I have to be aware of that when I'm here and go, okay, whenever I speak about men being men and stepping up and leading and laying down their life and whatever it may be, I have to have the caveat with me all the time. Now what I'm not talking about is men becoming abusive and jerks. And you know, like, I have to do that because I'm a servant to the culture and I know their story. And I know that at times I'm going to have to be mindful that when I'm saying certain things, it might be heard in a wrong way. So I have to be willing to th- rethink my language and rethink of what I'm saying and doing for the good of the people I'm c- trying to serve. Okay? And so that's going to take some, a heart of a servant because it means it's not always just about what I want what I want to say. I'm doing what would serve them in light of the story of their brokenness. Okay? I have to be careful when I'm, you know, you do, when you do um, Father's Day, you know, and you talk about how great dads are, and yet everyone's sitting in the room going, that ain't my dad. Now I got to go, okay, how do I serve a group of people who, who have been hurt deeply by dad? Well, that changes how I teach now. I got to think through that Father's Day may not be an exciting day for most people. So I've got to serve them in, in, in light of the story that I know is in the people that I'm trying to reach. Okay? See how that works? You're going you're to rethink what you do because you're a servant to them. Jesus came and he was a servant. So if you watch how he related to each person, it was different in accordance with their own story. The woman at the well, very different than the rich young ruler. Okay? Different stories. He's trying to serve them in light of their unique story and their unique need. Okay? Now, in order to do that, you're going to have to actually listen. Oh, I should have just keep those up there. Um, you're going to have to listen. 
So I'll keep family, missionary, servant. So I would say this is one of the challenges or problems potentially for many of us is that we don't listen well. Now, back to the, the pre-fall, God gave them a story, and then they went and listened to an alternative story. They stopped listening to God, and they started listening to the serpent. Okay? we got to ask ourselves, as the family of God, who are we listening to to inform our identity, to inform our sense of significance, to inform our sense of security? Is it God the Father or the Father of lies? And I, I will tell you, a lot of the church does not know how to listen to God. I just, it's a real problem. I, more and more, as I've worked with Christians, I've realized many of them never taught to listen to God. They've only taught how to talk to God. And so the idea that I would sit and say, God, I want you to speak to me. In fact, there's probably some of you in the room who don't even believe God does speak today. I would bet. Which is, I'm sad for you. Because I don't know what kind of relationship you have with a God who doesn't speak. Like, what kind of relationship is that? That's like having a relationship with Abraham Lincoln. You know, like he's a historical figure that I study about, and I really respect him. He's an amazing guy, but he doesn't talk to me. But God talks to you by his spirit. In fact, he says, my sheep hear my voice. They know me. Know me. And when I speak, they recognize me. So it's like, do you know him? Do you recognize him? Do, do, do you know what the Spirit's voice sounds like? What the Father's voice sounds like? How he makes things known to you? And some of you are going like, I don't know what that is. And I don't have time to teach you now. But I would say, like, there are some resources to help you grow in that. And if you, especially if you're a church planner and you don't know how to listen to God, I'm telling you, that may be one of the biggest things you're going to need to work on in this next season. Because if you think you're going to figure out how to do this on your own ingenuity and, and wisdom, man, you're in trouble. God's going to need to tell you stuff. He needs to speak into your life. So we got to learn how to listen to him. Now, back to this. Missionaries, what do they do? They listen to their culture. Hey, I, how you guys have been here a couple days in Tacoma? What have you been hearing here? And listening isn't just like what you hear. It's observation. It's taking in information. Anything? You notice anything? If you're going to be a missionary in our city, maybe it'll take you a few more days. Yeah. Yeah, there's a real, there's a real down-to-earth, blue-collar, kind of like anti, kind of the corporate, you know, it's, it really is a blue-collar feel here. Independent. Independent, yep. Kind of anti, you bringing in a, a corporate entity, you know, like people love independent coffee shops and yeah. stores and support the local man or woman, yep. The architecture, you can see it. I mean, there's hardly a house that looks the same anywhere. It's super friendly because we had a girl come in and just sit down with us and like act like she'd known us forever. All right. Cool. Okay, so there's some, there's some friendliness, some accessibility, some approachability. Yep, okay, good. Anything else? Now, if you're here long enough and you're listening to the Father and you're walking the streets listening to the Spirit as he's pointing out what's broken here, you're gonna to get to know, uh, as you listen, what are the problems and what the gospel needs to speak into and where, where he's saying he's at work and what he wants you to do next. And so you're walking in the spirit being led so that you'll know what to do as a missionary to care for our city. I would say if you're leading a group of people to go reach an area, teach him how to walk in the spirit and listen to what he's saying about what that place needs. He knows, he knows exactly what it needs and he'll tell you. And that will enable you to be servants because you'll actually know how to serve their real needs. Okay? You'll be able to care for them. Now, one of the greatest acts I will tell you as a church we can do is to listen. Do you know how many people pay tons of money to get a counselor to listen to them? Why is that? It's because nobody has the time to listen. And one of the greatest acts of service you could do to a group of people is just say, tell me about yourself. Tell me your story. In fact, it's one of the easiest ways to make people feel cared for and loved is to make enough space for them to tell you about themselves and to just keep asking questions. And the beauty is when you serve them like this, you'll know the third rhythm, and that is how to bless people. Okay? You'll know how to give them something that they need that will feel like a blessing from you. Uh, it's interesting that in the creation story, God blesses all creation, and then the serpent comes along and says, now use that blessing for your own good. Right? Make this all about you. And then God calls the people through Abraham, and what does he do? What's one of the phrases you heard probably during the story? 
What was that? Yeah, I'll bless you so that you can be a blessing to all the nations. Through you, all the nations will be blessed. So there's this idea that whatever's been done unto you has been done unto you so that it might be done through you to other people. Whatever God does for you, he wants to do through you. So whatever you have is not for your own sake. It's for the sake of showing the world how much of a blessing God is to people. So a lot of times we'll, we'll ask people, while you're listening to people's story, listen really closely to find out where they need to be blessed. And if you were to love them like family, where would you bless them? In Nikki's case, it was to fix her car. Okay? And that was an obvious one. Sometimes it's not so obvious. Sometimes it might be they're having marriage problems and no one's ever helped them think through how to walk through what it means to be a loving couple together. It might be they don't know how to manage their funds. So you might have to help them with finances. It might be like we had a group do. They found out there were several people in their mission community who had a lot of debt. And they said, well, God always blesses people to be a blessing to those who are in need. So a bunch of us have savings and a lot of extra money and a lot of you are in credit card debt and that's not good, paying too high of an interest. How about if we pay off the debt of those people who have credit card debt and we'll cut your cards because you probably shouldn't do that, you don't know how to do it yet, until you can handle it, no more credit cards. And so they paid off the debt of the people in the group who had spent way too much on credit cards and were in trouble because of it. Blessed to be a blessing. That's not unheard of. God's people had a regular time of a year of Jubilee where everyone's debt was forgiven. Why? Because it was a picture of the ultimate debt that would be forgiven when Jesus dies on the cross for our sin. Okay? Now you talk about a debt that was paid off. I remember I shared the story about the credit card thing once and someone said, man, are you sure that's okay? That sounds like you might just be creating code of, like people who just can continue on unhealth. I said, well, actually, Jesus dying for our sins to pay off the debt we owe to God when he knows we're still going to sin sounds like the same idea. And they were like, well, yeah, I guess if you put it that way. I said, now you might want to say I'm going to cut the card because I don't want you to go into slavery again. Just like Jesus says, I'm going to make it so you don't have to submit yourself to Satan anymore. You can get everything you need from me. So we might lead them to another, a better way of living, but it's okay to pay off their debt. Okay? No, they got to pay their own debt. That's how God works. No, it isn't. <laughs> Unless you reject Jesus, yeah. Then you will take care of it yourself. Okay? So we are blessed to be a blessing. So we'll often say, as a family, identify... What do you all have? This is a great exercise to try. Take a bunch of poster boards, have people write a bunch of post-it notes, everything they have. You know, like bank accounts, savings accounts, cars, vans, houses, clothes, shoes, vacation homes, skills, gifts, abilities, experiences. Keep going. And then you go, okay, now let's put them all up. Got them all up in front of us. Okay, amongst us, what needs do we have in the family? Is there anybody who has a need, like, could be met by anything you see up there? Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't have a place to live right now. Looks like one of you has an extra room. Could I come live in your house? Yeah, that's what family does. I wouldn't put my kids out on the street. They all have a bed. Okay, what else? Well, right now I, I'm without a car. We have two. You can use ours. And all of a sudden you start going, that's what family does for one another. You know, like, I've got an education in a particular field that you need help in right now. How about if I help you with that? I got skills that I can give you. I know, I can see your yard's a real mess. I'm good at landscaping. How about if I help you? Or whatever it may be, see? We're a family that's blessed to be a blessing first and foremost to each other. We need to hear that. If we don't take care of the, the family of faith, scripture says we're worse than unbelievers. We're not even loving each other. But then, then we go, okay, let's talk about our mission field. We got a group of people God's calling us to reach. If we believe that we've been blessed to be a blessing to the nations, who is it that God's called us to love and care for that are not necessarily here? What do they need? Wow, isn't it interesting that the school needs tutors in the area of math, and a bunch of us went to college. Wow, we could probably tutor kids in math. Oh, and we found out that right now in Western Washington, or in Washington, the whole foster system, taking care of kids without families, it's shut down. It's no longer funded at all by the government, which I think is a good thing, by the way. Um, so guess what, church? There's 8,000 kids without a home right now in our, in our state that will go into juvenile systems that are going to not love them well. Do we have extra bedrooms? Do we have families who can take kids in? 
Okay, there we go. There's another one. We could just keep making a list of all the things that our world needs that God wants to give through His church so that we can be a missionary people who, who are sent to them and we show them the servant heart of our God by the way then we serve them with what we have. Make sense? Now you won't, you won't know that if you don't know their story and you don't listen. You won't know how to bless them. But if you know their story and listen, you'll know how to bless them. And God has probably given you as a family everything you need to be a blessing to the people he sent you to. And now you get to show them what God's like by serving them with what he's given you. Okay? So those are just a few rhythms. It's probably good to take a break. Good time. And then we'll do the other three and put them all together. Okay? Any questions about that before we, we break? Following it so far? You see it in the overarching story? They forgot the story God told them, Adam and Eve. Of course, then Abraham, uh, God has to keep reminding Israel the story. Then Jesus goes, you've heard it said, but I say. And so it's constantly getting back to the story. Listening. Don't listen to the serpent. Don't listen to the father of lies. Don't listen to the world. Listen to our Father in heaven and the spirit who speaks to us as we listen to other people. Bless. You've been blessed to be a blessing. You weren't given what you have just for you. You were given it for the sake of blessing others so that God might ultimately be the one who is blessed by all people as we praise him. Okay?